When we examine the social conditions around the time of the first advent, we see that those who were determined to kill Jesus were very skilled in political pressure and manipulation, and we see that they were willing to distort the truth by any means available to them in order to accomplish the death of Jesus, which they thought was crucial to their own survival. When we look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were involved with the persecution and death of Jesus, we see that their motives were not good. Obviously, their motives were jealousy or hatred, doctrinal disagreements with our Lord. There was even greed involved in their motivation. What a contrast we see to the pure motivation of Jesus, who is driven by the wonderful principles of loyalty, obedience, and love. It's like putting light next to darkness when you have Jesus next to them. In our examination of the politics of the crucifixion, we're going to explore, to a limited extent, some of the inner workings of the Pharisees and Sadducees, as well as the unique position that Pontius Pilate played in all of this politics. We're going to see some of the backroom politics that might have gone on between Pilate and the Pharisees and Sadducees. What prompted Pilate to act against his natural instincts. He knew that Jesus was good. He knew that Jesus was innocent of the trumped-up charges against him, and yet he acted contrary to his inner voice. And so the question is, why? Why would anyone act contrary to what they know is right inside their heart? What would make a Roman governor submit to the will of the ones that he was governing? How did he become a political pawn in the chess game for the life of Jesus? And what lessons can we learn from that failure? Well, let's begin with the Pharisees, the group that had the most religious influence amongst the Israelites, the group that really was widely accepted as the religious teachers of the day. The Pharisees, you remember, were the ones that Jesus criticized the most because they were the most responsible for misusing the Mosaic Law and creating a situation where people thought that simply by following certain rules and regulations, they would be pleasing to God. The Apostle Paul taught that the purpose of the law was to lay the groundwork to prepare Israel to receive the Messiah. It was to teach them the heart qualities of humility, love of righteousness, and a heart submission to the will of God. That's what the real purpose of the law was. But instead, the Pharisees distorted it into a form of ritualism. It's always an important lesson to keep in mind that outward observance alone is not enough to be religious. The outward conduct must come from a pure and faithful heart. That deeper meaning of the law is what most of the Pharisees missed. The name Pharisee means separated ones. It's believed that it was originally given to them as a derogatory name by the Sadducees to depict how they separated themselves from the common people. But you know that idea of being separated one sounds like the scriptural concept of sanctification, doesn't it? Well, a Pharisee, if he were here, would say, by all means, that was us. We were doing holy things, and that's what separated us. But what most of them really did was set themselves apart because they just thought that they were better than the common man. Their separateness was largely the result of pride and a feeling of superiority. And again, there is an immediate lesson for all the Lord's people because there is always a danger for anyone who has a relationship to God to begin feeling that the reason you have that relationship is because you are worthy of it. And of course, the scriptures teach us that that's simply not the case. But if we begin to believe that the Lord is dealing with us because of who we are, then we are in the same spiritual danger as the Pharisees found themselves. One of the main elements of the Pharisees' theology was that they believed it was necessary to add to the written law of Moses. They added what they called the oral traditions of interpretations. Now, we usually frown on that. Anyone adding anything to the, to the word of God, we usually say is bad. But you know, that's not always the case. There were situations when something had to be explained. For example, when the law says that no work should be done on the Sabbath. What does that mean? And so the Pharisees attempted to interpret what that law meant so the people would know how better to follow the law. In God's estimation, what constituted work 
on the Sabbath. Knowing that would be helpful for someone who was trying to be obedient to the law. Originally, the oral traditions were not a rigid code that contained only one single interpretation. The interpretations originally allowed for some flexibility. So we could see that some of that could be helpful to a Jew who was trying to follow the law. Even Jesus accepted that concept to a point. In Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3, Jesus addresses the practices of the Pharisees. And he says, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. The uh, commentary, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, has an interesting comment about these verses. Comments on the phrase, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And they say, the Jewish teacher stood to read, but he sat to expound the scriptures to interpret the law. So Jesus seems to be referring to the traditions of the Pharisees in expounding the law. How they, he, they encouraged the people, he, he encouraged the people to observe their expounding of the law. But what he told them to avoid were their practices, of course, which were hypocritical. Jesus went on in verse 4 to say that they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with one move them with one of their fingers. You know, had the Pharisees the honesty of heart to follow their own interpretations, it is likely that they would not have made those interpretations so burdensome on the people. And so there's another lesson, that we should be careful of whatever traditions that we set up ourselves, that we take care to follow the Lord's word as closely as possible, but where there is room for interpretation, that we allow the latitude of thought and study and practice. Brethren, the last thing we want is for the Lord to look down upon us and say that we are too narrow-minded, that we should be more generous and open-hearted. Now, I, when I think about the two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I'm usually a little confused about the differences between them. But when you look into them a little more closely, you see that they were quite different from one another. And much of the first Advent politics was played between them. Apparently they, for the most part, hated each other. And they disagreed on most things. And yet when it came to Jesus, they somehow found a way to work together and cooperate. The Sadducees appeared to be the first group that existed in Israel's history. The word Sadducees comes from the term House of Zadok. It's believed that this Zadok was the high priest who lived during the reigns of David and Solomon. Of course, that's when the first original temple was built. And so during that time, this Zadok had established his house in the priesthood and gained a tremendous influence over the nation of Israel. So the Sadducees basically made up the priesthood of Israel. When the New Testament speaks of the chief priests coming to Jesus, it's talking about these Sadducees. The Sadducees did not accept these oral traditions promulgated by the Pharisees. And that was always just about the major point of disagreement and contention between them. Before the days of our Lord, there had, become, uh, there had come a great shift of religious influence away from the Sadducees, away from the priests, and towards the, the Pharisees. Apparently, the Sadducees had been greatly influenced by Greek philosophy. And because of that, surprisingly enough, they lost interest, for the most part, in the temple sacrifices this was the priesthood who lost interest in the sacrifices of the temple. And so the Pharisees grew as a result of believing that the young men of Israel needed to be taught and educated in the law. That just wasn't happening with the Sadducees. They were becoming more involved in Greek philosophy. As a result of all this, the Sadducees were losing their religious influence over, over Israel. And they became more concerned with their political power in the operation of the state of Israel. With this pulling away of religious influence by the Sadducees, the Pharisees grew, and they became the prominent religious teachers of Israel. They eventually controlled the local synagogues as the place of instruction of the law 
Because of their daily involvement in religious matters, they gained the religious confidence of the people that the Sadducees were losing. At the first advent, the Sadducees then had become the politicians, while the Pharisees were the theologians. Although the Sadducees always acted very religious, their prime concern was political power. And of course, the Pharisees originated the belief and practice of the oral traditions. A major policy that affected the leadership of Israel at the first advent was the Roman philosophy of no longer allowing the Jews to appoint their high priests. Can you imagine that? The high priest of Israel no longer being brought up through the ranks of Israel as priests, but now were appointed by the Roman governors. Annas and Caiaphas, the two men who were the most responsible directly for the murder of Jesus, were both appointed high priests by the Romans. So you see how that changes the whole feel and atmosphere of what was going on in Israel. Annas, you remember, was the first one who interviewed Jesus after his arrest. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Annas, history tells us, had been appointed high priest by Quirinius, the Roman governor. Now, if you were the Roman governor, obviously you would appoint someone in the high priesthood who would tend to favor your operation, who would be more your yes-man, if possible while still appearing to represent Judaism. Though there was a measure of autonomy as a Jewish leader, this high priest would always have one eye turned towards Rome, knowing that if he displeased the Roman governor, he could easily be replaced. In the book, The Life of Christ by Farrar, he says, Since the days of Herod the Great, the high priesthood had been degraded from a permanent religious office to a temporary secular distinction. Now you remember under the original Jewish arrangement, the high priest was appointed for life. And so it really was an unusual situation at the first advent to have two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. And the reason for that was that Annas, because of his dominant personality, had ruffled some Roman feathers. And so he was removed from office while his weaker son-in-law, Caiaphas, had been appointed in his place. Annas, however, because of that dominant personality, was still the man behind the Sanhedrin. And so we see Jesus brought to him first, and then to make it official, he was sent to Caiaphas. Well, brethren, with that brief background, we get a little feel for the political pressures and intrigue that were going on at the first advent. We see the tenuous relationship that the enemies of Jesus had with each other, there was a willingness to manipulate each other for their own desires. So that when we see these things happening in Jesus, it's no surprise. These men were manipulators. These men operated with an eye to their own selfish goals and ambitions. I'd like to turn our attention to some of the discussion that Jesus had with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Remember after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and the scourging of the temple. We see that Jesus stayed in the temple for the rest of the day and he healed the people that were brought to him. So right away you see what a difference that Jesus, what a different use that Jesus made of the temple than the money changers had done. The temple had become a money machine for the Sadducees, a den of thieves as Jesus described it. But to Jesus, the temple was a place to worship God. It was a place to teach the principles of God and to serve the needs of the people. In Matthew 21, 15, we see the reaction of the priests and Pharisees to what Jesus was doing. It says, And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. What right did they have to be sore displeased? What was it about the wonderful things that he was doing that could displease them so much? On the following day, Jesus returned to the temple and gave a succession of three parables that directly related to the Pharisees and the priests. The first was the parable of the man with two sons. Remember how in the parable, the man asked each of his two sons to go work in the vineyard. The first son said that he would not go but eventually changed his mind and did go to work. The second said that he would go, but he never did. 
And so then Jesus asked the scribes and Pharisees, which of the two sons did the will of the father? And of course, they answered, well, the first one did, the one who who actually went. And then Jesus brought the lesson home in the latter half of verse 31. He says, Verily I say unto you, that the publican and the harlot go into the kingdom before you. Ooh. (laughs) What a stinging rebuke. His application was clear. They were the disobedient sons of the parable, who, like the first son, said that they would do the will of the father. But when it came right down to actually doing it, they refused, preferring their own ideas of service instead. What a lesson, brethren. How important it is for us to do all that we can to know what the will of the Father is for us individually. If we don't really know what he wants us to be doing with our lives, then we can make the same mistake. You know, this was particularly stinging to the Pharisees because they believed in a coming kingdom. They believed that in order to enter the kingdom, they had to live holy lives. And yet here, Jesus told them that the lowest dregs of society, the tax collectors and the harlots, would enter before them. The next parable was a similarly stinging reproof. It's the parable of the vineyard. You remember the parable was about a vineyard that a man had planted and given it to stewards to care for it. When the time of harvest came, the owner sent a servant to receive the fruits of the vineyard from the stewards. Jesus said that the first servant they sent, that the master sent, was beaten. Then one was stoned, another was killed. Finally, the owner sent his own son, thinking, well, they'll certainly respect my son. Of course, that wasn't the case. The stewards killed the son, thinking that they could take the inheritance for themselves. Well, the Pharisees hadn't caught on yet that he was speaking about them again. So when Jesus asked, what should be done to the stewards? The Pharisees replied that the owner should kill the evil stewards and give the vineyard to more faithful stewards. Then again, Jesus brought the point home to them in verse 43 when he says, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Ooh, another stinging rebuke. But think about that, brethren. After taking away the stewardship from Israel, who has he given it to? He gave it to the Gentiles. He gave it to you and me. We are the new stewards that he's given the Lord's vineyard to. And of course, the point of all that is that he expects fruitage from the vineyard. Fruitage is the crucial element that you and I are to be working on. That's what the Lord wants from us. Well, the Pharisees finally got the point. And in verse 36, we're told that they wanted to lay their hands on Jesus, but were afraid of the multitude. The third parable given in Matthew 22 continued to press this point of their failure. It's the parable of the wedding feast, where the invited guests refused to come, and they treated the king's servant spitefully and slew them. Sounds very similar, doesn't it, to the previous one. As a result of their actions, the king slew them and burned their city. And the invitation then was to go out into the highways and the byways for new guests. Well, the Pharisees and Sadducees didn't need an interpretation for this parable. They understood that, again, Jesus was aiming it at them. And so now these two forces in Israel, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, take counsel together how they might defame Jesus. It was the Pharisees who came up with the first plan. In Matthew 22, 16, we're told that the Pharisees sent some of their disciples along with the Herodians to trick Jesus with a question about taxation. Now, these were very clever men, and their scheme shows a worldly wisdom that obviously took forethought and planning. They were going to pretend that there was an honest dispute between their disciples and the Herodians. The Herodians were members of the royal court of Herod, and so their interests were not religious. They represented the interests of Rome. The disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians came to Jesus with compliments and pretensions of respect. In the latter half of Matthew 22, 16, they said to Jesus, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Well, they made their questions sound sincere. 
but their intent was solely to get Jesus into trouble. They had devised a question that apparently had no good answer because no matter how Jesus answered, he would be criticized. Brethren, this is an example of playing politics. It was a political trap set by the presence of the Herodians because they represented Roman interests. If Jesus should say that it was not proper to pay taxes, which really was a sentiment of the, of the Jews before him, they could report him to Rome. The Pharisees knew that if you became an enemy of Rome and taught this particular thought of not paying taxes, then you might as well give it up. Rome would not stand for that. So what side would Jesus take on this hot issue? Well, before Jesus gave his brilliant answer, he first dealt with something much more important. He pointed out the false humility of those who approached him. He said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Jesus was very tender and understanding when sincere people came to him for help and had genuine questions. But he was sharply critical when people faked their genuineness. As was the case here, he knew they came with impure motives. The way Jesus answered was so logical and disarming that it all left them in stunned silence. Now, of course, there are only two possible answers to the question. Yes, it is proper to pay taxes or no, it's not. He had to choose one, and he did. But the way he did it taught a lesson to those who would otherwise have been angry with his answer. You remember how he answered? After calling for a Roman coin, he asked whose image and inscription was on the coin. And of course, when the people pointed out that it was Caesar's image and inscription, inscription, Jesus simply said, Well, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. Now, Jesus was implying something about those who refused or didn't like the idea of paying tribute to Caesar. He was suggesting that even debating this issue of the tribute money, they were neglecting the things of God. There again is another lesson for anyone who claims to be religious. Men fuss and work for things of the world, but seldom do they recognize what they owe to God. That's the point that disarmed them for those who were waiting for Jesus to make a mistake so they could spring their trap. That was the power of Jesus. Not that he was just more clever than the Pharisees, but that he went to the heart of the issues. In their minds, the issue was about a few tribute coins. But Jesus dug deeper and he made the connection to their higher responsibility towards God. That was the real issue that none of these men were thinking about. And that's what we get when we deal with the Lord. He sees through the fluff of our lives and he gets right down to the heart of things if we're willing to listen to him. The question for us is, will we be stuck on the trivial issues of life or we will we really see the importance of the deeper issues that the Lord is trying to teach us. We can spend a lifetime and never really consider what Jesus is pointing out to us about ourselves and our own lives. Now everyone who heard his answer marveled, and they certainly couldn't refute it. As usual, it was the Pharisees who were made to look foolish. You know, they were supposed to be the great teachers of God's law. But everyone could see that this simple Galilean who wasn't preoccupied with the way he looked or the way he sounded or his popularity, was really the great teacher. Seeing the Pharisees rebuked, the Sadducees came with their own scheme against the great teacher. And again, we see politics in its most worldly form. They came with a trick question of their own about the resurrection. The reason they chose this question was because not only did they want to discredit and defame Jesus, but they wanted to discredit that doctrine as well because they didn't believe in the resurrection. If they could make resurrection look unreasonable, then their own position would be vindicated and they would look good and Jesus would look foolish. We see the same clever plot to come with a question that seemed impossible to answer. Remember what they asked. They said, Master, Moses said if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren. And the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. 
Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For all had her. Now, they thought that was an impossible question to answer for someone who believed in the resurrection. Jesus knew all about the teachings of the Sadducees, and again, we see his answer bringing in more issues than the questioners themselves had in mind. He knew that the Sadducees believed in the written law of Moses, and so Jesus used that authority to prove his point. He answered that, In the resurrection they shall neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Well, Jesus knew that the Sadducees did not believe in the existence of angels. And so he, in turn, gave them an answer that they would find impossible to refute. And then in verse 32, he quotes the writings of Moses. He quotes Exodus 3, 6, which says that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Jesus adds that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, these holy men of God must receive a resurrection because a principle of God is to give life to those who serve him. That's what he was saying, and that was his way of proving that there will be a resurrection. Well, was that merely a clever rebuttal for a clever question? No, Jesus didn't speak just to sound clever. When he rebutted the challenges of his enemies, it was an example of truth being stronger than challenges. It was the power of the truth, not his cleverness, that deflated this seemingly unanswerable question. He built on the writings of Moses that the Sadducees respected to really give us a new insight into the resurrection. There will be no marriage in the resurrection. Think about that. That gives us an interesting insight in the type of society that will exist in the kingdom. If the Sadducees had not tried to stumble Jesus, we might not know that fact. So in a way, I'm glad they tried that. But I'm not glad for them, because if only their ears had been opened to this great master teacher, what a difference it would have made in their lives. Did these men really think that they could trick Jesus? Well, at first they did, but they learned that they were no match for him because he had more than human ability on his side. He had insights into the truth that came from the mind of God himself. They could not challenge that. As we said earlier, the Sadducees had for the most part concentrated on the civil operation of Israel. Consequently, we see very little interaction between Jesus and the Sadducees in the early part of his ministry when he was more of an insignificant religious teacher. It's really not until the very end that we see the Sadducees take an active part in the persecution of the Lord. What was it that finally got their attention and that got them involved in scheming with the Pharisees? Well, the fact that the Sadducees even noticed Jesus indicated that they came to attach a political significance to him. They were worried about his popularity and his claims of kingship. As Jesus became a more powerful force in the Israeli society, in their minds he became a threat to their political power. Now there are two things that go together in this world. Those who seek worldly power are almost always seeking wealth to go with it. Wealth in many cases is power in this world. It was the wealth of the Sadducees that, that Jesus also threatened. It happened when Jesus scourged the temple of the money changers. You know, Jesus actually did that two times. He did it right at the beginning of his ministry, and he did it right at the end. Of course, the fact that there was a second scourging necessary meant that they had recovered from the first one, and the money changers were thriving once again in the temple. Notice that in the early part of Matthew 21, It was after the second scourging of the temple that the Sadducees began to take an active part in trying to discredit Jesus. In the final scenes of the Lord's life, the Sadducees are the primary movers in carrying out his death. The Sadducees, remember, because they're involved with politics, had influential ties with the Romans. They were accustomed to dealing with the Romans, and so they really were best fit to carry out their evil motives. It was the high priest, the priesthood, the Sadducees, who were personally affected by the scourging of the temple. 
And so they manifested their outrage through political cunning and influence. Farrar comments on this very point. He writes, There is every reason to believe that the shops which intruded under the temple porticos were not only sanctioned by their authority, but even managed for their profit. To interfere with these was to rob them of one important source of that wealth and worldly comfort to which they attached such extravagant importance. Notice that the first place that Jesus was taken after he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane was to Annas. Like I said, not the official high priest, but the real man in charge. Annas, as well as Caiaphas, were Sadducees. Jesus' action in the temple gave the Sadducees their motivation and their desire to crush Jesus. But I found it interesting that in the trial of Jesus before the Sanhedrin, the scourging of the temple was not mentioned. If it really was such an important reason that motivated them, why didn't they bring that up in their accusations? The reason was because Annas and Caiaphas knew that the selling, the money changing in the temple, was something that was obnoxious to the Pharisees. The operation of the temple had been an area of great contention between the two groups. You can just see the political playing back and forth. The, the, fair, the Sadducees didn't want to do the sacrifices, but they wanted to control the temple. They wanted to control the treasury. The Pharisees wanted to do the religious training. And so there was a headbutting always at the temple. The Sadducees knew that this money changing was something that the Pharisees hated. And so to bring it up at the trial of Jesus would have just caused contention between them. That wasn't their goal. The key to the Sadducees and Pharisees getting what they wanted and seeing Jesus killed was to find common ground. That's just what a politician would do to get what he wants. The treatment of Jesus before Annas, Caiaphas, and the high, uh, Sanhedrin is really a shameful thing. In the book, The Life and Times of Jesus the, Mesh the Messiah, Alfred Edersheim writes about the proper procedures which the Sanhedrin normally followed as they tried criminal cases. <clears throat> For example, in Jesus' case, he cites the absence of note-takers or court recorders as we know them today. He notices the absence of a defense attorney for Jesus. You know, we might think that having an attorney to represent a defendant is a modern phenomenon. But remember that our Constitution is, is largely based on the Mosaic Law. So it was common practice back then to have attorneys and have representation and rights. He also notes that a verdict was always decided upon through a vote of the Sanhedrin members. Edersheim says that the fact that the proceedings were held in the palace of Caiaphas, his personal dwelling, rather than the usual meeting of the Sanhedrin, which was more neutral ground, would have outraged every principle of Jewish criminal law. And lastly, it stated that according to Jewish law, a verdict could not be decided on the same day as the trial. This was especially true if the verdict was death, that the verdict could not be given on the same day as the trial. Brethren, were any of these things done with our Lord? Not one of them was followed according to their own customs and law. Clearly, politics took precedence over principle. But then after examining how, as a trial, the proceedings were illegal, Edersheim says that this was really not a formal trial, and no sentence was actually pronounced by the Sanhedrin. Of course, the uh, authority of pronouncing death sentences had been taken away from them by the Romans. What the Pharisees and Sadducees were really trying to accomplish was to find some charge that would convince a Roman governor that this man was worthy of death. In other words, this was more like an inquisition than a trial. When they finally led Jesus to Pilate, they took him not as someone who had already been condemned, but as someone who they had charges against, who they felt was worthy of death. But even the thought of an inquisition begs a question. Under a system whose judicial groundwork had been laid by the Mosaic law, what right did they have to convene an inquisition? Who was there to defend Jesus' rights? Who was there to object to unfair questioning or badgering? Who could stop a guard from slapping Jesus for giving an answer that he, was, he construed as disrespectful? If this was not a trial under the Mosaic law, the rules of fairness and the spirit of the Mosaic law still should have applied and so the entire proceeding should never have been allowed 
So let's call the examination of Jesus before Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin an inquisition rather than a trial. Like the inquisitions that came centuries later, false witnesses were brought forward. Unlike the refined questions that the Pharisees and Sadducees had devised earlier, these witnesses were ill-prepared and they contradicted themselves. And so it was obvious to these smart men that these false witnesses would never stand up before Pilate. In Luke 23, 2, notice that the charges they presented to Pilate were nothing like the conclusions that they had come to a blasphemy in the palace of Caiaphas. And speaking to Pilate, we're told, they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Well, that wasn't their earlier conclusion. But they knew blasphemy meant nothing to Pilate. That wasn't grounds that he would accept. And so we see them playing politics again in creating charges that would get Pilate's attention. Of course, the charge of forbidding to pay tribute, you know, was a blatant lie. They had heard his position on tribute money just two days earlier. But because it suited their purpose, they created this false charge. They connected the forbidding of giving tribute to Caesar with Jesus' claim of being an anointed king. The word Christ means anointed. You know, if Jesus had wanted at this point, he could have brought up the issue that it really was the disciples of the Pharisees who had disagreement with the Herodians when they came and tried to trick him. If they had a disagreement, then obviously the Pharisees were the ones who were saying that it wasn't proper to pay tribute. He really easily could have used their own tactics against them, but he didn't do it. He chose not. The other accusation against him is interesting. They said that he perverted the nation. The thought in the Greek is that he stirred up the people to disaffection and rebellion. On what grounds could they make that claim? He rarely spoke of Rome. His message was, love your neighbor as yourself, not rise up against the oppressor Rome. (laughs) Well, first of all, these men didn't need legitimate grounds for their accusation. But if you look back to one of the false witnesses brought against Jesus, you remember that one of them accused Jesus of saying, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Actually, that's not what Jesus said at all. The statement that they were referring to was made three and a half years earlier at the first scourging of the temple. After he scourged it, the Jews came to him and said, by what authority do you cleanse the temple of the money changers? And Jesus said, destroy this temple. In other words, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. You see how they got it wrong intentionally? John explained that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. And the Jews thought that he was speaking of the literal temple. But even if he was referring to the literal temple, look how they twisted his words. Could Jesus' statement in any way be construed as subversive? Was this planting the seeds of rebellion in the minds of the people? They knew that it wasn't. They changed Jesus' words to make it sound that way. And now they were trying to make, portray him as a king, undermining the authority of Rome. Well, brethren, looking back on these things, we have to marvel at how Jesus accepted the injustices. Do you think that he was aware of the improper procedures that were being followed by the Sanhedrin? We saw how Jesus could refute any argument brought against him. He knew the many differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He knew that they knew they hated each other, and they were only together because of their common hatred for him. He could have easily set them against each other and walked away a free man. But he knew something far more important. He knew that his freedom meant our continued bondage. As long as he lived, we would remain in death. As long as he walked the earth, the Adamic curse could not be lifted. These were greater issues than the injustices he endured. He was the only man on earth who knew these things. And he knew, because of that, that he had a higher work to do than defending himself. For now he must be silent as a lamb before its shears. Brethren, his lack of self-defense, his silence, 
is truly an ex- eloquent expression of understanding God's mind and loving mankind. Had he freed himself, we would never have the hope of the resurrection and of God's kingdom. Doesn't that just make you shudder to think that we would have nothing to look forward to? As the political wheels continued to turn against Jesus, we want to briefly look at the role of Pontius Pilate. You know, of all the enemies Jesus had, here was someone who was in greater measure sympathetic to him. Was he really so weak that he caved into the demands of the priests so easily? The answer is no. I don't think he was that weak. What made Pilate act against his instinct of releasing Jesus were a number of previous experiences that he had had with the Jews. Jewish historians tell us of three previous encounters that Pilate had with them that seemed to shape his thinking in the trial of Jesus. We don't have time to go into them specifically, except to say that one of the encounters led the Jews to write a letter to Tiberius complaining about Pilate's actions. And Tiberius answered with a rebuke of Pilate and the command to rectify the issue. Tiberius came down on the side of the Jews. You know, the policy of Tiberius was to keep the provinces content as much as possible. And this policy became extremely important in shaping the later thinking of Pilate. You know, Caesar's policy was for men in Pilate's position just to just kill anyone who was giving them trouble. <laughs> then Pilate's job would have been much easier and he could have dealt with the Jews in a much simpler way. I think Pilate would have been a much more ruthless man and much less swayed by the Jews had it not been for this policy of Tiberius of keeping the people content, of keeping the tax dollars rolling in. And because of that, Pilate's role became much more complex and much easier to influence through the threat of rebellion and blackmail and writing letters to Tiberius. Through these encounters with the Jewish leadership, Pilate learned that they were not afraid to go over his head and report him to Caesar. Notice how this fear of violating the policy of Tiberius influenced his decisions. In Mark 15:15, 15, 15, it says that Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered up Jesus to be crucified. Pilate learned that the policy of Tiberius Caesar to content the people had to be followed as closely as possible, even when his own natural inclinations were struck strongly the other way. <clears throat> The John account shows us again the dread of displeasing Caesar that hung over his head. In John 19.12, we see the cunning of the Sadducees and how they manipulated Pilate with this policy. It says, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Well, when Pilate heard them say that, he tried one last time to save Jesus, but they shouted back that they had no king but Caesar. And in the end, Pilate was compelled to a judgment that he really did not want to make. Pilate could not give the Jews another reason to write to Tiberius. The reality of a life, the politics, politics of the situation became very clear to Pilate. His survival instincts forced him to give in to the unjust demands of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Pilate has become the ultimate example of self-preservation over principle. He would not jeopardize his own life or position of authority, even for the sake of justice. And as a result, Pilate has gone in his, down in history as a weak and guilty governor, one too morally shallow to forbid the crucifying of an innocent, sinless man. But Pilate's guilt is far less than those who brought these false charges in the first place. The interaction of the chief priests and the Pharisees with Pilate in the crucifixion of Jesus is not just an isolated case, but one incident in a broader ran of, uh, span of experiences between them. The relationship between the Sadducees and Pilate was already full of hatred and mistrust. There was a political chess game going on here, and it's clear that Pilate was no match for the cunning of the Sadducees. In examining all the events as they fell into place, we see that Satan always tries to thwart God's plan. He thought he was doing that by corrupting the religious order of Israel. Many of the traditions of Israel became their stumbling blocks. 
Satan was also involved in tempting the Sadducees to become politically involved rather than keeping strictly to their priestly duties. Later, of course, when Jesus was on the scene, Satan clearly sought to destroy him. And yet, the wonderful thing we see is that God used the evil motives of others to accomplish nothing else than the salvation of the world. That is thrilling, that God has that ability to redirect evil for good. That is tremendous wisdom. That's the perspective that Jesus had as he stood before his accusers. He knew that God could do that. He had the knowledge of an eventual good that would result from the hatred he was receiving and the persecution he was enduring. He knew that God's way, though often a more difficult way, was the best way and would eventually accomplish the most good. He knew that Satan's use of the Jewish system was not an indication of God's shortcoming, but it was the wisdom of God using someone else's evil intentions to test and perfect Jesus. Paul told us that Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. Without the evil intentions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus could not have been perfected through suffering. That is amazing to me how God can do that. When Jesus was before the Sanhedrin, and Caiaphas demanded to know whether he was the Christ. Jesus, really in one of the rare instances in his life, said that he was. That admission sealed his death, and he knew it would. What seemed a catastrophe to the disciples became a great blessing and example to them when they eventually understood that this was a willing and necessary submission to death. Yes, his enemies played politics to kill him, but Jesus was never concerned or involved in that game. He came for one purpose, to do the will of his Father and to save us all from the curse of sin and death. When we look at the failings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we see the lesson that true religion is not based on outward form. In fact, quite the opposite. God hates it when people pretend to be religious. He is looking for sincerity and conviction. And so, brethren, it is imperative that we each search our own hearts and remove anything that is pretending to be religious or holy. When we look at people like Pilate, we see how important it is for us to live by principles and to defend those principles when necessary. Brother, one of the things that I absolutely love about Jesus was his ability to quietly accept the injustices done to him for the sake of pleasing the Father. Pleasing God was more important to him than being unfairly persecuted. That is one of the legacies that he's left for us. There are so many lessons and examples that we receive from him. Let me suggest to you that for the next few weeks that each of us choose some of the qualities about him that appeal to us the most and to meditate upon those and to praise him for having those qualities and for the hard work it took to mature and develop those qualities. I'd like to borrow the words of a sonnet. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Let's try to do that for the next few weeks leading up to the memorial. And I'd like to get us started by sharing with you just a few of the things that I love about him. I really love his desire to look out for the poor for the widows, for the sinners. He paid attention to the fringes of society and was often moved with compassion for them. He had absolutely no concern how he looked to others by associating with those so-called lower class of people. And so he felt no social pressure to act a certain way. His concern was for those with the greatest needs. In that same regard, most people would think that being the savior of the world made him so busy that he would not have time to spend with the children. But he did. He made the time. Can you imagine some of the memories of those children that they carried with them the rest of their lives that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, had enough time to spend and talk with them? These were precious moments and seconds on the earth that Jesus had. And he spent some of them with children. Another thing I love about the Lord was his devotion to his disciples. One particular example that will always stand out in my mind 
is when he hung on the cross. Here while suffering the most physically agonizing experience possible, he thought of his mother's well-being when he asked his disciple John to care for her. My goodness, what a selfless person to think of his mother while he's got nails in his hands and his feet. Don't you think that John and Mary were both richly blessed by those few words that Jesus uttered through his agony? I also love his appreciation for little things. I remember when one of the women poured oil on him and she was criticized for wasting such a valuable commodity. How Jesus came to her defense because he saw the heart motivation behind this gift. His ability to see the good in us is a priceless quality that he has because so often people judge by the outward appearance. But he looks right at the heart and he can appreciate any goodness he sees there. I also love his ability to serve the needs of others, his readiness to serve it. Remember the times when after a long, grueling day of teaching and healing, he was exhausted and he needed to rest and recuperate, but people would still pursue him and come and find him in the wilderness. He never turned them down, but he was already always ready to bless, no matter what it cost himself. Another example of that spirit was when he spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, After speaking about her life and her needs, he saw an honest hunger in her that satisfied him like a gourmet meal. (laughs) You know, when the disciples returned with food, they couldn't understand why he wasn't hungry anymore. They wondered if he had eaten while they were gone. And in a spiritual sense, he had. He definitely transcended above the physical things of life. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He made his grave with the wicked. Though he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.